A very good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining Coffee with Vance. As usual, here is my cup. That's me and coffee first. I hope everybody's enjoying a beautiful Tuesday evening. And um, I, as as uh, as you all know, that today's topic is going to be a very uh, in-depth uh, knowledge and also a sharing session because one of my guest speaker is a, a brilliant soul um, who have taken his time to come and share. But I'm just going to repeat that whole title here today. Um, what you should know about dementia, um, sleep deprived and stress. Because if you notice that at this current pandemic, even though we are moved to stage two, even for Malaysia and Singapore, as we are getting evolved and getting prepared for vaccine and so and so forth, there's also a situation where people are falling under a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depressions, and so and so forth. So many issues are coming up. So and that's why we at Kopi Advance decided that we should invite a neurologist and Dr. Sandiran. He will be here in a minute. Uh, before that, I'm going to talk a little bit on the topics that we're going to share and and how are we going to do this in uh, in the next 45 minutes or even one full hour with a lot of Q&A to be shared with you all. But as I mentioned, um, the dementia is a bit scary, but we all should not be scared. But I think in worldwide, around 50 million people have dementia. And this uh, this this information I'm giving you is, is actually taken from the World Health Organization um, in September 21, 2020, so just a couple of months back, with nearly 60% living in low and middle income countries. And every year, there are nearly 10 million new cases, the estimated proportion of the general population age 60 and over with dementia. But also there's an interesting uh, statistic that came in that as young as 30 also can happen to have dementia. But that one, I'm going to leave it to doctor to come and talk a little bit on that. So that's going to be dementia. And I'm also going to talk a little bit on um, the sleep deprived. A lot of us are chasing after the dollar sign. Sometimes we don't have a very peaceful sleep, uh, lifestyle related behavior in the major cause of insufficient sleep in the majority of Singaporeans. I mean, of course, um, statistics, your doctor is going to talk a little bit on Singaporeans and a little bit on Malaysia statistics if we have the time later. But however, it's very important and it's critical, critically important to realize that the sleep deprivation can be due to underlying medical conditions, but a lot of people do not understand, right? It can be chronic insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea. So that also doctor is going to really uh, come in on board later to talk a little bit on these are the statistics that he's going to share with it. Um, but a very interesting thing that all of us are constantly going through is also stress. So the one part is dementia, another part is a deep sleep and stress. So let's not wait any more single second and I'm going to bring in doctor on board. So let's get this answer, dude. Hello, doctor. Hello. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes, I'm sure everybody can hear you, Doctor. How are you there? Yes, excellent. Good. Thank you for joining me on this uh, Tuesday evening. Thank you, Doctor. And so thank you, Vance, for inviting me. Where, where, where is your coffee? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> on the way. Okay, okay. Later, later we'll you. <laughs> thank you, Doctor, for so much for joining. Uh, but, Doctor, I know that you said you do not uh, want to go straight to the topic. But I think maybe just maybe about 30 seconds of your introduction. I think that will be good for the viewers as well. I mean, I told them about you a little, but I think yeah, it's best, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, hi, yeah. hi, I'm, I'm everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me again. I'm I'm Satindran, yeah, we leave the doctor in the hospital and uh, I'm just Satish for short. It's nice to hear from you or, uh, you know, sort of get, it, get in touch. Thank you, Vance, for having me on again. Uh, I'm just uh, a, a, a neurologist in private practice. I've been a neurologist since the year 2005. Before that, I worked with the Malaysian government service uh, uh, all over the place. I worked, uh, I did a stint in the psychiatry hospitals as well. So, and then, you know, then I realized that, you know, there's this link between all this and neurology. And then I somehow gravitated towards neurology. And right now I'm with the Glen Eagles Hospital in Penang. Um, I've been there for the last uh, ten, five years. Before that, I was in another private hospital for 10 years. Before that, I was uh, with the government service uh, as the head of uh, Penang Neurology Services. 
So without further ado, friends, shall we get on with the thing? Yes, yes, yes. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, friends, I overheard you saying you know, a lot of statistics, but I don't think people want to hear statistics. I want, I think they want to hear more of the facts and then we can go back and talk about uh, what they need to know. I think numbers are just boring. Don't you agree? You know, you know Doctor, that's one part I liked about you because when we had a discussion earlier, uh, I think about two days back. I know the way you push things back. I know this this chat is just not going to be a Q and A like it, it's right. and it's going to be a lot of argumentative. But right. let's get it done, right? That's where all the let's, fun is. Let's about. make it let let's make it lay person, you know that kind of thing. Okay. Now, so Dr. I, I, before we jump ah, into the topic, I got to stop you for a while. But to the viewers out there, if you're seeing this, please do share and give a lot of your questions if you do add. But please do like and share. Because then yes, a lot yes. of people can be getting all this information out there, right? So thank you. So doctor, are we ready for the presentation? Yes, I yes. am. Okay. One second. Okay. Yeah, no worries, uh, doctor. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll bring the the folder upward. All right. Here we go. And here's the slide show. Yes. So. The curtain unveils and we are going to try and cover three different, somehow related or not related uh, topics. Um, but um, this is what the terms lay people use. They are not medical terms. So because I'm going to correct those terms as we go along. But this is just to tell what lay people, they are worried about being senile. They are worried about being stressed and they are wor worried about being sleepless. The three S's, right? So let's go on. Right, senile. The word senile is so, so way back then. We have stopped using that for a long time. And now the right word is actually dementia, right? What is dementia? I'll come to that, but it's an umbrella term for the loss of memory and other thinking abilities, which are severe enough to interfere with daily life, right? Out of dementia, 60 to 80% are actually the Alzheimer's, which most people are familiar with. Then you have other kinds of presentations like Lewy body, vascular dementia. Now, what are vascular dementia? Are dementia that develop after you've had a stroke. Once you've had a blockage in your blood vessels, part of your thinking process goes, and then you have a vascular dementia, right? And then you have other more... Uh, sort of Parkinson related and tumor related kind of things, right? And a lot of times there is an overlap, which is called a mixed dementia. That means a little bit of everything causes everything. Now, actually, what happens is dementia. Most people have a lot of concept or misconceptions about it. Well, the brain, you know, is like a motherboard in your handphone or your computer that each part of the brain has a different function. Some, some of them manage memory, some of them manage judgment, some of them manage movement. All right. And when these cells in the particular region are, 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 are sort of damaged for some reason or the other, the region cannot carry out its functions normally or it cannot communicate with each other. This then triggers a decline in the thinking skills. Uh, it's these thinking skills or things that you have learned before are known as cognitive abilities. A lady who has learned to cook from her mother has cognitive abilities. The day your father or your mother taught you to drive your car, it's a cognitive ability. And over time, when you start losing these connections, right, then it slowly also affects your ability to function as well. It also affects your behavior. It affects your feelings and then how you interact with other people or your relationships go. So again, Doctor, I like to have, sorry. Doctor, I just have to uh, obstruct you here for a while. Um, what is the youngest, uh, I mean, patient or youngest person you ever seen with a dementia? No, dementia, it starts, Alzheimer's usually starts after you are 60, right? But if you have a different kind of dementia, like the Lewy body or the vascular dementia, I've seen people with 40 who have already got signs of dementia, but it's not usually Alzheimer's variety. The Alzheimer's starts either in your mid to late 50s or after your 60s usually, events. Okay, no problem. Right. Carrying on now, there, again, I highlight it is wrongly referred to as senility or senile dementia, right? Because those days, everybody said that everybody who grows old has some form of dementia. But that's not exactly true because a lot of people who have passed their 80s 
are perfectly functioning as well as as normal. I, I mean, if you know a, a recent prime minister we had, he's in his 90s and he pretty much functioned, uh, you know, in a very reasonable way. And so just to tell you that the term that we start using as senile, we have stopped using it because the word senile means old and not everybody who's old is demented. Okay. So now, uh, let's see. What do you see? You see memory loss that disrupts daily life. The patients have challenges in planning or solving problems. They have difficulty completing familiar tasks. They have confusion with time or place. Right? They have trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. Meaning, you know, if you're driving, you look at a, a, a signboard, you don't know what it is. Or if you look at a, a signboard that says uh, turn right, you don't know what and how far you need to turn right. That's a spatial problem. And you don't know how much you open your door to get in, right? Then you start developing new problems with words. You start to misplace things. Sorry, Doctor. I mean, we just have to, uh, I think we are losing your voice here. I mean, in terms of the microphone. So I think, okay. probably, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, are you better now? Yeah. Yeah, it's clear now. Thank you. Okay. And then there will be, you know, when you have decrease or poor judgment and you start misplacing things, the suspicion is, you know, paranoid ideas come, the maid is stealing my thing, my children are stealing my things. Uh, a lot of times this, this causes a lot of strife in the, in the home environment. Patients then start to withdraw from social uh, and uh, work activities and they have a lot of changes in mood and personality. Now, you need to know about things that might come as if they are dementia. So, a doctor needs to not just say, oh, you have this, 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 you are demented. No, we need to look. They might be depression. There could be sometimes medication side effects. Certain medications, especially, uh, you know, sort of opioid painkillers can give you memory problems. Huh? Medications for other things that you're taking may cause that. Patients who are using excessively... Uh, taking a lot of alcohol, those with thyroid or vitamin deficiencies start to have very similar problems. Okay, And how do we diagnose? Yeah, you need to see one of us. We have a number of tests we can do, the mini mental state exam. We take a proper history. We rule out all the other uh, mimics of dementia. We will do a physical examination. We run some laboratory and radiological tests, but just to make sure, make you uh, sort of highlight this that radiological tests are not very definitive. The brain scan may be normal, and the patient may have dementia, or sometimes the report comes back as some shrinkage, but the patient still has a lot of reserve left behind. And, the, uh, you know, they somehow is like a brain in a gold bar, you know, you know it's maybe a small one, but it's still very valuable. So that kind of brain can still function, right? So we can... yeah, but, but, uh, doctor, so if let's say someone who in the early 40s or early, I mean, mid 30s to late 30s, but they tend to have this um, forgetfulness, right? Every single thing or every day, oh, where did I leave my phone? Or they use a CD, where's my phone? You know, these, these things... Is this a kind of an indication or is this a kind of uh, forgetfulness? Is okay. there a class again, 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 the, the, the height of the, the, the issue is this, Vince. When you're talking about just not loss of memory, is that what I mentioned, loss of cognition, things that you have learned before and you're unable to do. You're unable to do. You know, you're you're Sorry, Doctor. I think uh, we are losing your, your, your mind. Ah, never mind. It's all right. Uh, let me let me let me uh, uh, come nearer to the thing then. Okay. Um, yeah. So you what you do is you lose cognition. You lose um uh, things that you have learned before. That's the first thing. You know, like a lady who has suddenly forgotten how to cook. That is really a problem, right? But if cook, <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. A carpenter who suddenly has forgotten how to, you know, plug in his drill is already starting to have problems. But loss of, I mean, sort of memory problems which you can retrace, usually that is not an issue. Usually you're fine with that, right? So that is most likely sometimes stress related rather than um, uh, sort of dementia per se. So that's okay. why I said. So, doctor. Uh, so just a just a quick uh, uh, a post question to you. So if let's say if I'm a carpenter and I forget about that skill totally, I forget and I come to you. I, I I do not know how to do this. 
So is it an early stage of dementia or is already in a dementia? That is no, that is already, you're already pointing towards that, you know, it's not everything that you forget, you know, you, you, a lot of times there are other issues, but a lot of times all you need to do is figure out how much he has forgotten, what are the things that he's forgotten and whether, you know, given time he can recollect it back again. Right? It shouldn't happen so suddenly. It's not like yesterday you remembered carpentry and then today you somehow cannot remember carpentry. That's probably not it, uh, Vance. Okay. Roger that, Doctor. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, how the next question is how do you prevent dementia? How do you prevent dementia, right? The first thing is all healthy lifestyle choices. Okay. Healthy lifestyle choices, right? Uh, healthy diet, do not smoke take regular exercise, uh, practice a lot of cognitive stimulation, do sodoku, do the crossword puzzle, play yeah. computer games if you have to. You see, when your parents only don't play computer games, well, now we are telling you play computer games, right? Decrease, will decrease the uh, risk of cognitive decline and dementia, right? So all this is just in this in this little diagram here, you need to have a lot of social engagement, go out with your friends, join in the conversation, have a lot of cognitive stimulation by doing Doctor, puzzles. Uh, yeah. uh, Doctor, I'm just going to pause you here for a while. Uh, I mean, it would be great. I think I just checked your Facebook, but I think you've got to share this to your Facebook so that your participants also can actually view it. So if you can do that, that will be great. Okay, yeah. hang on. No worries. We can... Uh, we can do uh i will i'll talk something to the viewers all right viewers thank you so much for listening up i know you will have a lot of questions so please hold on it while doctor will start sharing this um, page to his facebook all right so that his participants and his viewers also can see that but if you do have any questions please do uh post it up because i can see some of the questions already coming up uh which doctor and you know if it's fitness related of course i will cover and if it's something to do with a lot of the enough part, then doctor will uh, uh, will, will cover it. Sir. Do you need some time, doctor? Yeah. No, I'm okay. done. I think I think I've, I you know what it was only for me. I think I was sharing it only to myself. So now it's uh, shared to the public already. Sorry, okay. I must have missed out that one. All right. <laughs> Privacy okay. settings, I guess. All right. Lucky I got my son beside me to do all this okay. technical. You got assistant. assistant. <laughs> no, I told him, no, don't embarrass me. So. <laughs> you, you still need the, the young guys in the past minds. <laughs> okay, coming to the last part of this slide, uh, what do you do for dementia treatment and care? It is actually, first of all, look out for the cause. Right? If it is a progressive Alzheimer's disease, you know there is going to be a decline. Technically, there is no real cure and no real proven treatment that slows or stops its progression. We do have, we do have a, a number of things on the on the market, but uh, not really uh, proven to actually slow down. You buy yourself a little bit of time, but the problem always remains. By the time we realize that something's going on. Uh, it's already quite advanced in the stage because a lot of times people just think that, you know, they're having a senior moment and this and that. And then by the time they actually seek help, it's actually way into the mid range of that. They may improve symptoms. We also need to look at all the other risk factors that can be changed, which I covered earlier. So that, that was about dementia. So we get uh, but but uh, let me just uh, uh, maybe perhaps this might be going on in a lot of the viewers' mind. Even right. right now, this is going in my mind. I think you will be the best person to answer this. Um, right. You know, with the current pandemic, with the current stress, the lifestyle situations, and uh, people are, you know, that's that's a topic we choose. We deprive sleep, so many things. Uh, I, I know it's going to be a little tough uh, to answer. Probably it might be easy for you, but I find it's a bit of a challenge. Is there an a indication or a direction why dementia develops? Is it because of old aging? Uh, is it because we're not active or is that something that we can prevent you know why there's only a certain people are getting it why certain is there a, a, a some kind of a indication for the people to understand that oh i need to do this so that to prevent that is no actually no uh, the, the the a lot of times this question is asked but the problem is the, the thing is it's how you're wired it's how much brain power you've been given 
you know uh, if you talk about i mean let's just talk about a car engine for example you know there you, you have two different cars from two different places some they can run 500,000 kilometers without a problem. And some of them, by the time it's 200,000, something or the other starts to give way. Our brain is also based on this kind of blueprint. We are given an, a finite number of brain cells with finite number of connections. But not genetically, it, some of it is not actually wired to actually uh, run the course. Some of it starts just like your kidneys start to fail earlier, your pancreas starts to fail and then you get diabetes. Your brain can fail in the same way. You know, it's not structured to actually run the course. Mm. So, 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 so that to, to short it up, so there's no indication, but is there some, I mean, you have shown us that slide here where, yeah. you know, to do the crossword, the puzzle, the reading. So All keeping right. the body active or the keeping the body active, can we All say right. that it can prevent or delay? Is it is yeah, that right? It definitely does. It definitely does. It definitely does in that way because what you're doing is you're building more connections to the brain. Right, you don't. You're not. Everything in our mind is a set of connections. The brain is a set of connections. When I see you, uh, how my brain reacts is a set of connections. When I, you know, I stimulate my brain, I form new connections. So, with, when you have many connections, as they start, period of time which you can, you know, de delay that slowly, right? If you are very we have another question, Doctor. Sorry, if I can I just say that and then you can continue. So Audrey Chan has asked, is it a genetic for dementia? Yes, it is genetic. Yes. You carry certain genes, but please do not confuse genetics and hereditary. A lot of people make that mistake. You know, it's not because if your parents have it, you will have it. It is not. The genetics means that the hand you're dealt with. You know, if you're playing poker, you're given a hand by the, the person dealing. You, you, It's the hand you're dealt with in this birth or, or in this life. So it is a genetic setup, definitely. That's why I put down there you, on this very slide, you can see some risk factors like age and genetics cannot be changed. But please do not confuse that with hereditary. That means if your parents have dementia, there is no guarantee that you are going to get dementia. And vice versa, if they never had dementia, doesn't mean you are off the hook. It is just the set of permutation of cards that you're dealt with as your genetic makeup is being made. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for that. So uh, that's for the dementia. But of course, we will come back there again when more I'm questions. I'm sure we're going to revisit this in a while. But uh, let's, uh, if we'll move on then. Yes, okay. Doctor. Now, if that has not done it, stress. You are definitely stressed up when you hear this. What is going to happen if I get senile or when I get demented? Well, let's talk about stress. Now, stress is one of the most misunderstood, you know, um, um, features of our life. And everybody thinks either stress is put on or you look for it uh, or you should be doing without it. But actually, what is stress? Stress is a feeling of emotional and of physical tension, right? It can come from any event or thought that will make you feel frustrated, angry or nervous. Now, stress is actually hot wired in everybody's body. You know, it is a reaction to a challenge or a demand. In short bursts, stress is positive. It's, you know, it helps you to avoid danger. It helps you to meet a deadline. It helps you to perform as a normal human being. But when the stress starts to last for too long a period, it will harm your health. Right? Now, this diagram on the, on the left, uh, the, differentiates the two terms. Remember, I told you that stress is what the lay person uses, and then the doctors use a different term. Well, stress is caused by an existing stress factor or a stressor. If you can see this guy, he's got a bee buzzing by his ear, and that's annoying him. And then after a while, he starts to get stressed up by the bee. But if that bee has gone away, or the bee was never there, and he still gets a, a repetition of that feelings without him being able to control it, that is called anxiety, right? It is the stress feeling that is there once the stressor is gone. Okay. Now, I reiterate, stress is a normal feeling. You know, there are two main types of stress, right? There could be acute stress, right? This is a short-term stress, right? You suddenly slam on the brakes, somebody cuts in front of you, you have a big quarrel with your partner or your friend. 
you know, someone does something to you or you ski down a very steep slope or go on a roller coaster, you feel <laughs> the feeling of an acute stress. It helps you to manage dangerous situations. It's hot wired. Even a deer in the African jungle is under stress. The tiger, uh, the lion is also under stress, right? Doctor, it also... Uh, yes, sorry. sorry, just have to obstruct you along the way. You know, sometimes they say that stress is also the growth. If you don't have stress, you're not growing. I mean, in terms of uh, speech, I mean, people say that, you know, it, it actually constantly pushes you. But too much of that, it can lead to other issues. True. I'm coming to that because you, this is what I mean. This is actually hot wired into you. It, at one point in time, we used to talk about type A and type B personalities. I don't know whether most people remember that, but type A are those driven uh, people who you know score all A's in their A levels. They move on to a good university. They take the best courses. They keep. They are driven. Uh, you know, there's nothing that uh, can push them down. That kind of type A personalities. This they are driven by stress. So as I said, if you can or they can manage that, then that stress is going to be productive. But if you try to do that same thing when your body cannot cope, then you fall, you drop, your body gets overworked, right? So then you go into chronic stress. Chronic stress is a stress that lasts for a longer period of time, right? For example, if you have any money problems, an unhappy marriage, you have trouble at work, is no solution in sight, there's nothing you can do about it, you move on into a chronic stress stage. Some people are able to put it on the back burner of their mind. They, they just forget about it. They are able to ignore it. But the vast majority, they are running at a, at a, you know, the sort of, it's like a car that comes, parks in the garage and doesn't get the engine switched off. You know, throughout the day, throughout the night, the, the, the sort of engine is, keeps running. So there's a lot of wear and tear inside, right? It can go on for weeks or months, right? And sometimes you, after a while, you, you get so numb to it, you don't realize it's a problem, but your internal organs are complaining about it, right? And if you don't find a way to manage that stress, invariably your body will give up, you know, it will go into having health problems. You know, doctor, uh, one of the risk factors for blood pressure and also cardiovascular diseases is also related to stress because constantly yes. your heart is under stress. Uh, I mean, right. of course, the hormones in another part. But, you know, your right. heartbeat are going up and even though I'm Correct. sitting there talking to you, but I'm probably running a, a, at a treadmill. So that's kind of a, the systolic yeah. and systolic uh, The right. engine that doesn't shut off. Yeah. yeah and go. this comes to exactly what my next slide was going to say. Your body will then react to stress by releasing certain hormones, right? These hormones give you the drive. It's just like a deer that wants to run away from the lion that is going to appear out of nowhere the body somehow thinks there's a lion coming out from somewhere and it will keep releasing these hormones and this will make your brain more alert cause your muscles to tense up and this causes a lot of headaches because when the tight muscles start to press on your head you get these tension headaches very often mistaken for migraine attacks and then they keep taking medications for migraine but it's actually a tense muscles there and then your pulse rate goes up right these are good in the short term they help you push through for a short term but not for the long term and as I said once you have once you have chronic stress your body then stays alert but then over time guess what happens as Vance correctly pointed out you develop high blood pressure heart disease diabetes because your your body keeps trying to churn out uh, sugar to to keep the fuel burning so to speak you know to keep the fire burning fuel needs to come out and this then leads to obesity because you don't move around a lot you're just worrying about something it moves on to depression then swings over to anxiety and then depression again and you actually start having some kind of skin problems you start breaking out in acne or eczemas women start having menstrual problems you have this diarrhea, constipation, or an irritable bowel. You become forgetful. Ah, you see, this is the one that you told me, the 30-year-old guy. You know, most of the time, that forgetfulness is actually due to stress rather than dementia because his mind can only do one thing at a time and he forgets where he put his car key and his phone. You know, but after some time, when he retraces his steps, he'll get it back. But again, this, you see, forgetfulness is the one that we are talking about. They complain about all sorts of aches, pains, headaches. They have, because they have spent so much of the energy worrying about something or 
the other they lack the energy or the focus right they have sexual problems they can't perform in the bedroom you know all that kind of things they start thinking that they're becoming important but actually all they need to do is to have a clear mind to get it going but they don't have that they have stiff jaw stiff neck they are tired they either have trouble sleeping or they sleep too much to the extent that they don't really function because they are so knocked out or they use sleep as an escape tactic. Some of them are able to do that when they are worried, they just go to sleep and they just switch off their problems. You know, upset stomach, they sometimes rely on too much alcohol or they rely on drugs. Then they also have either weight loss or weight gain. You know, doctor, uh, sorry, if you can just pull back the previous uh screen i mean previous slide okay. actually, interesting things that you you mentioned here um yes. of course someone who's stressed i mean there's some kind of indications you know you can see the high bags the posture you know the yawning but some are very good at uh wearing mask a different mask which means they like you know very happy but inside they might be carrying 20 tons of sorrows 20 tons of correct, issue. correct. Uh, how correct. can these people get help because i think Help is one part that I think you and I agree. The stigma, which I think we are going to talk a little while. But how, what is your what is your take on this? Why people do not want to get help when they think that there is an issue, but they they, they think they are happy? No, because this this I I I, I tell you, it's I, I feel it's a little bit of an Asian thing. The Asian child. I'm not just mentioning any country but in general uh, i've been to india i've been to indonesia i i see it's a sort of an asian phenomenon i've also been to the west in the asian uh, mindset admitting that you have a problem is a sign of weakness okay okay yeah. right then there are a lot of people who are trained from young never to show because somehow you think that someone will take advantage of you Sorry, Doctor, I just lost you what you said. Sorry, I, I cannot hear you. A lot of times, the worry is, you know, your most children are taught that, you know, if you show some sign of weakness, someone will take advantage of you when you're down and out. Okay. Right? So, so what happens so I, is... So ah, I mean, the issue. Uh, issue. Yes, they teach the children how to have some kind of other coping mechanisms or not to have such a sign of weakness where you know you have to sacrifice your you know a lot of your own thing you know so this is how a lot of people learn how to suppress the stress you know so that suppression and the, the inability to release it or releasing it in the wrong way which actually then begets more stress gets you into more trouble you know some people re release their stress by being promiscuous you know they have a, a number of boyfriends or girlfriends uh they, they 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 juggle them around and then finally you know that stresses them out more because the stress of actually trying to juggle five relationships in one go uh you know takes its toll on you even more but in front of everybody you, you maintain this facade because you are trained from small do not show that you're weak. Someone will bully you. Someone will take advantage of you. Or, you know, the teachers may think you're not smart enough to be in their class. They might demote you to some other class. So you just bear with it. Go through it. It'll get better when you're an adult. But it does not. So I can see that the, the culture is um, it's passing down generation to generation. Yes. And, uh, but uh, on. it's an add-on effect. You know, what stresses the previous generation stresses the current generation, but you have had a few more things to boot, you know? Doctor, um, yeah. I mean, of course, uh, in my 20 years of uh, in the fitness industry, there are, um, there are a few clients that I trained, but of course, we're not going to mention names here. Um, stress can push it to depression. I, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this, these two elements together at this point of time. Yeah. Once you are stressed... Yes. And then, yeah, it's more right now. No, you see, because it's actually part of a spectrum, when it's a very good question. Actually, if you think how I explain it to you, this is we are all on a seesaw, right? Uh, you know, sometimes you get up feeling good about the, for the day, sometimes you feel a little bit down, sometimes you feel elated, sometimes you feel a little bit down in your mood, you know, for no real reason. That is the normal human psyche. But after some time, you start going further and further uh, away from this midline. 
you know that means you either become too elated or too anxious and then and then what happens is when you have too much of anxiety the chemicals in your brain called neurotransmitters that keep you happy get depleted when they get depleted there is a predominance of the sad neurotransmitters the neurotransmitters that make you feel unhappy or low in the mood uh, these are also important neurotransmitters imagine if you go to a loved one's funeral and you start laughing you know yeah. obviously something is wrong so you have another neurotransmitter that assesses a sad situation and makes you either cry or keep quiet or tells your brain not to come up with some silly jokes in somebody's funeral that's the one that stops you but the problem is once you finish off the chemicals that elate your mood the what's left behind is the one that makes you really down and that starts to fun start move functioning uh, relatively more and that's when you move into depression so if that makes any sense that's exactly how it it works for a lot of people that's why they have these swings of mood one day they are a little better and then next day you see they are really really down because they have that that normal movement that slight movement of the center of a seesaw once you move to the edges the the magnitude of the movement is much more and that's how you you come with very discernible or very identifiable depression or anxiety thank you so much doctor for that but uh, pertaining to this uh, one uh, of the people by the name of tavani i'm just going to bring that whole message to our screen if you can see that i can uh, listen my slides uh, events sorry sorry doctor I, i can only see the slides that i'm presenting okay. i can't see my okay so i'm going to i'm going to um, read this question to you that you posted yeah. here is uh -huh. it is 5 HTP slash HTP5, yeah. a beneficial neurotransmitter supplement mm -hmm. for stress? Question mark. Mm -hmm. A combination of HTP5 and mechanism supplement beneficial? Question mark. A prolonged usage of HTP5 as any side effect? So she wants to know: Is there any side effect for the both? Okay, that, no, that's exactly what the medications that you are taking as anti-anxieties, drugs like Xanax. drugs like um, uh, clonazepam uh, drugs like lexapro they all they all modify your neurotransmitter balance you know it's like when you bake a cake and suddenly it's not sweet enough you just add a little bit of sugar into the batter it becomes sweet so these drugs work in that way so what they do is they come in and then they try to fill the void and then hopefully your brain then realizes that this is the right concussion and then the next time your brain makes the concussion correctly so that's basically all the drugs as she mentioned it works along that way but it doesn't work as well as the original one that you are given with your brain has its own 5 ht has its own serotonin you know so when you give something that this one is like putting in artificial sugar rather than cane sugar or whatever thing that you're making it because of cane sugar you put in white sugar it just doesn't taste the same but it does the job the same thing is so the, the, the problem is the so called side effects is not really side effects per se but after you start realizing how good it feels when you are patients and then you develop a psychological dependence meaning that you feel you cannot function without them You you start thinking that it's just like a lucky pen or a lucky under. You know, the seventies or eighties, the way the same as the body is not before. But you have the psychological dependence. Sorry, doctor. I think uh, we lost your voice a little. The mic. I think uh, if you can just help us a little. Okay. Uh, no, it's just like what I told you. You know, those drugs you develop a psychological dependence. Thank you, doctor. So as uh, something. when something like that this is what we call by the kind of dependence all right doctor thank you for that tania hope that the uh, that answer as um, i mean that the, for your question that answer has been answered for you so okay doctor so we should move on and i think uh, if we want to come back and then we can we can always it. go back yeah no yeah. problem okay now again i've already covered this is just to reiterate anxiety is an emotion by feelings of tension worry thoughts and physical changes like increased blood pressure it is the fight or flight reaction and a condition called generalized anxiety disorder 
So again, it's chronic. It's there for a long time. You will have it for some time. And you will have excessive, long-lasting anxiety and worries about non-specific life events, objects, and situations. Your brain takes everything, however minor, as a lion coming running after you. That kind of thing. You, you feel that kind of feelings. You feel like you're going to have a heart attack at any time. You feel like you're having a stroke. This you remember Once you were asking me why I go at night, sometimes some of my patients come with this. They think they're having a stroke at 3 a.m. in the morning when actually all they're having is an actually an anxiety disorder, right? So you have to go through the whole setup of tests, but basically at the end of the day, you're very happy when your patient has generalized anxiety disorder. Not for anything, it's because that means they don't have anything much more serious than that. Having said that, the patient suffers a lot. Although it's not dangerous to them, they suffer a lot with a generalized anxiety disorder, right? They are on their toes all the time. They always feel unhappy. Nothing you can say changes their mind. You know, you may have shown them a normal ECG and half an hour later, they will still be convinced that they are having another heart attack and they'll want another ECG done. So these people undergo a lot of, uh, you know, sort of um, unhappiness. They're always on edge, right? And then uh, I work. Sorry, doctor. Can I just ask? So, this generalized anxiety disorder is it uh -huh. quite common among the human population? Oh yes, it's actually it's more common than you think. There are so many people walking around with this. You know, these are the kind of people who sometimes get you know uh, photograph on YouTube. You know, going ballistic or you know doing something really bizarre they actually might be having a generalized anxiety disorder you know at that time they are convinced that something bad is about to happen to them you know they may react to people around them in the same way so that's called a generalized anxiety disorder and they do have a, a treatment for this and a, some kind of medication you will need some kind of anti-anxiety and sedation medication these are the few conditions where you really need the, the patient to be treated because you know it, it's like revving your engine at 7000 rpm constantly you know relieving the engine running is one thing leaving the engine running at 7000 past the red line rpm you yeah. will blow out your engine you know sooner rather than later that's a given already you know doctor after this uh, course of medications and these therapies and these uh, sessions um is there a possibility i'm sure there is a possibility for them to stay away from the medication or is it something that they have to do it for the rest of their life? No, usually it depends on the patient. The patient needs to actually try to overcome this. But it's not easy because your, the, your brain tells you it's a heart attack. It keeps telling you it's a heart attack. You keep telling the brain no. The brain tells you it's a heart attack. So normally what you do is medication then sort of rewires your brain. It What it does is it tells your brain what reaction is needed in what situation so then after some time you will find that they somehow uh, get down to it or at least they know they know that when they're going to develop these sudden attacks they know what medication to quickly take first calm down you know take it easy for a while and then they usually have an escape mechanism after some time but first of all they need to be convinced that it is not what they think it is you know and that's why a lot of times they think the doctor is making a mistake the doctor is being too nonchalant about the whole thing he's not sympathetic enough uh, then they keep jumping and shopping from doctors to doctors because it's very hard if you tell them nothing is wrong they go to another doctor if you tell them something is wrong you're actually fooling them so it's a two-way street it is very difficult to actually uh, you know get it right each time I understand Thank you, Doctor, for this uh, this segment. Um, sh shall we go to the next slide? Uh, not yet. I haven't covered panic okay, disorder. Sure. Right? Yes, panic disorder is a generalized anxiety that comes on very, very abruptly. And, you know, people just um, actually sometimes ambulance to the hospital because they are so distressed, right? You need to have at least four of this palpitations, pounding heart and accelerated heart rate very sweaty, you have tremblings, you have uh, shortness of breath or you feel that you're being smothered, you have choking feelings, you have chest pain, chest discomfort, you have abdominal or nausea distress, you feel very dizzy, you feel unsteady, you can't walk, you feel like you're having a stroke. 
uh, there are chills and alternating with heaty sensations. You know, it might be blazing hot and you're feeling cold or it's blazing cold. I mean, uh, very cold and you're feeling really hot. You get this paresthesia. Now, what is paresthesia? Paresthesia is a sensation of numbness. It's like the pins and needles you get when you have you know, slept on your one hand for too long. You get this paresthesia. But these patients get paresthesia at any point. So they feel that paresthesia is actually another stroke where they can't feel their hand and their leg. But it's actually a pins and needles sensation. Then they also, a lot of times, they feel very, what we call derealization. You know, you feel that the, the place becomes very unfamiliar because your brain cannot process the signals. You might be right in the house that you're staying for 20 years and you felt that you have never been in this place before right or you sometimes become depersonalized you don't know what you are you don't carry out your job you you may be a, a say a nurse but you suddenly don't even know how to do your nursing thing you just feel like you're a different person right a lot of them describe it as you're going crazy you know that kind of thing and they have this feeling of impending death or doom so you have this fear of going to be so you can actually see people actually screaming for the ambulance and then you know they really get worked up and it's all sorted out the moment they reach the hospital as the panic disorder dissolves and it comes on suddenly even if you're aware of a panic disorder i've known so many people who know about panic disorders yet when they have one of their own totally blows their mind you know it, it, that's the last thing on their mind. You know, when you tell them it's panic disorder, they say, no, 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 this is not that. I know what a panic disorder is. But that's how we do it. Okay? You know, doctor, uh, just to touch on the panic disorder a little, um, you mentioned that a particular person might be having a situation whether it can be a uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack, you know. But right. what they need to hear is assurance that you are fine. But does that, is that, acoustic that you are fine don't worry everything is good will that calm the person down because what they have is a doubt but the problem is they know sometimes the patient i mean knows a lot now the sometimes the patient is not convinced when the doctor tells them you are good because they say you say i'm good i don't feel good you know a lot of times some of them need a test to convince them some of them are satisfied with just an ecg but some of them know they want an angiogram. They, they think that you have missed something. You are not seeing properly. They read somewhere that, you know, 10% uh, of ECGs may be normal in a heart attack. They want and uh, the, the test of choice is angiogram. They don't mind going for an angiogram in the middle of the night, paying the doctor extra to get that done. So it also depends on their level of thinking, you know, what their mind has locked on. A lot of times they are not satisfied until an MRI of the brain is done there and then. So at 3 a.m. in the morning, we need to call the, the 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 radiographer and we need to sit there and wait until the MRI is done and then show them and tell them, yes, this is normal. The radiologist has seen it's normal. Then they start to relax a little bit. Okay. So um, so the whole thing has been controlled by, yes. by, by, the, by the brain? Oh. Everything is from the brain. It's how your your brain has a setup, uh, Vance. It it what it does it it releases neurotransmitters automatically because you have a subconscious um, control of your brain. Now you know you see something happy or you win the lottery or you get promoted, you automatically feel elated. You don't have to sit down and think. Now I got something good. I want to be happy. You don't have to. It's there. Or you somebody you know died or your pet dog dies or something like that. You don't have to think. Oh, this is a sad situation. I need to cry. You will cry automatically. That's because your subconscious mind takes care of 80% of what you're doing. It assesses every situation, including, you know, the noises that you hear around you. Then it sieves and filters that. Now, if I hear a noise behind me, but I know my doors are locked, I really won't worry because I know it's probably, you know, somebody walking behind me from, from my family. But if I don't, every noise makes me wonder, oh, is that something? Is that a ghost behind me? Is this that? Is that this? You know? So that's what it is. Is it also, doctor, because I, I, I mean, I, I will share a little experience of that. But before that, I just want to know also, doctor, is it because we are constantly on the go and we are constantly thinking and moving so that, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, a meditation. I mean, meditation doesn't really need to be on a certain religion, but just uh, sitting down calmly or reading a book or swimming or whatever that you do can be also yes. a meditation. Is that no. the reason why we do not have it? 
is, is that we're not spending enough time for us well it depends it depends on what the environment that we live in is uh, vans think about it you know if you are living in a highly strung environment today is a tuesday night some of our viewers may have a target tomorrow or they may have a make or break um meeting tomorrow which you know if they don't fulfill a certain number of quota of sales for example their commission is going to go out and that commission they were banking on you know sending their for their child's college the next uh, upcoming term so that kind of thing how can you relax understand you can't relax because tomorrow the presentation and it's out of your control you present is up to the client whether they are going to accept your presentation and, and give you the contract or they are going to go with the next pretty woman that comes along you know so you think about it that way there's these are the, the problem is we have now gone into situations where we cannot change the outcome that the outcome is beyond our control you know sickness in hospital the doctor can sometimes make you right sometimes they cannot tomorrow your car may go into the workshop and they will drop a bombshell of a, say a ten thousand dollar bill on your car saying that you know this motherboard of some kind has gone off and uh, your car is either going to be junk or that so how can you change that so these are the things that even how you meditate you cannot change the fact that tomorrow morning you've got this thing coming that is out of your control you can't say no you can't choose whether you want it or not and then you're going to get toasted lah. so that's why some people are lucky because they have a situation where they can but these people also seem to compare themselves with others who are really self and think oh i'm not doing enough you know that guy is you know doing more he's stressed up i am not stressed that means i'm not doing enough i need to get stressed up and then they delve into more and more things and you know they are craving for that because they feel they are not doing enough with the short time they have left on earth you know what they are thinking is oh my neighbor has worked hard and he's bought a, a condo for his child or he bought a house for his child or bought a car for his child i am just doing normal and relaxing here you see i can't afford to buy my child a car so you it starts playing on your mind then you start thinking i think i better take on a second job and that's how the so people can have a around this you know this uh, uh, this why certain western countries only look for sorry doctor we just lost your voice a bit there sorry this why certain countries in the west they only make you work 48 hours a week or less and they give you some for paid holiday because they realize that a lot of their citizens the cost of paying for the stress related problems is so high that they rather just give you your time off and force you to rest mm. you know they make it unprofitable for you to work too hard so looking at that that is a thing but i don't see that happening either you know in both our countries in malaysia or in yeah. singapore i'm quite sure that you know you you cannot convince most people to say let's take uh, two days off without a single uh, activity you know so it doesn't happen that way those people there only work three days a week four days a week their yeah, their stress levels are much lower and they don't end up with all the stress related medical issues thank you doctor thank you for that this this upcoming slide that you are seeing now is the same thing it's just telling me what exactly uh, i've told you this now right these are exercises and what you can do to reduce stress you can do your stress management you can do relaxation techniques there are so many things you modify to your liking you know you cannot force everybody to do the same thing you know some people are happy just doing tai chi some people are happy with yoga some people are happy with just playing badminton it all depends on what really relaxes you it's very easy do it if you feel good after it it's probably relaxing do it and you're still thinking oh my god i'm playing this game but presentation tomorrow morning the slides are not ready that's not going to happen okay then you need to have certain exercises that will try to replace negative thoughts with positive ones so you put all the negative thoughts on a piece of paper that you think is causing anxiety and then you try to move it to positive believable thoughts like you need that means you are your own and you are able to do it yourself 
take out all the negative thoughts. Try and tell yourself why this is not. Sorry, Doctor. I think your wife breaking down a bit. Sorry, then. Okay. I'm so, you don't know where's my son's mic lad, in this computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, uh, I need to find out where is the mic. I think it's here, but uh, for some reason it's not. Yeah. So then that's you all. Okay. So that's what I think it's there on the slide. I just was saying what I saw. Uh, I had written on the slide. So try to move your negative thoughts to positive ones by making a list and reading it again and again. Right. Then you always talk with people who are supportive. Right, you get a family member or a friend. Uh, in the West, we have a lot of support groups. Again, as I reiterated in the beginning, a lot of times in Asia, people are too embarrassed or too shy to be in a support group. They think talking in a support group is a sign of weakness, and they refuse to go. Uh, they refuse to share, and, and then they are going there to just find somebody who is worse off than them, and then they come back feeling better because somebody is worse off than them. So that is the wrong attitude. Just to tell in general, because I've seen a lot of people who just went to a support group and said, Oh, yeah, I saw five people worse than me. I felt much better. You know? So then, of course, exercise, you know, doing whatever kind of exercise. There are gyms, there are swimming, there's something that you can do, right? And we'll talk about counseling, right? Psychological counseling, right? I will cover uh, what this is called a cognitive behavioral therapy or a psychotherapy. Uh, or a combination. You see the word, the word they hear, psychiatrists are must be mentally unwell. No. Specialists and they are professionals who know how the mind works and then they work your mind. This is like going to a coach. You know, you may not want to play football very well, but you still need a coach because you need a person to teach you all the things that you think you knew but you didn't know. You know, right. Doctor, um, just coming back to the, the slide that you talk about exercises, um, right. I, I want to cover a little uh, aspect of that. Um, right. I mean, usually what I do is uh, when we go for our coaching sessions, especially when you come for the one-to-one -one training sessions or even in a group session at this point of time, uh, what I have discovered that, you know, a particular person, say, uh, Roger, okay, let's re mention Roger, right? Roger comes in. And I can see uh, his stress uh, by the way, you know, his eyes probably didn't have a sleep and his posture is down and he's very quiet and you can see his motivation and the energy level is down. But I got to tell you this, dog, uh, after a 45 minutes of cardiovascular exercises that elevates the perspiration comes out, I call it the weakness that leaves your body through the perspiration and a little bit of um, muscular contraction and in eccentric, you know, just some workouts on the muscle to activate the muscle fibers. After a good 45 minutes or 55 minutes, you can see a change in the chemical reaction. The dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin, and the endorphins, I think, all kicked up. And to a certain level, they become like a happy bunny or, or happy chirpy bird, you know. So can we say that the exercise is some kind of a drug? to play in part the human performances. True, exactly. Because the endorphins, the pain of exercise, you, 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 the so-called no pain, no gain kind of thing is actually because endorphins are released when you overwork your muscles. When there is pain in the muscles, endorphins are released. That euphoria overrides any other uh, sort of um, distractions you may have in your mind. So you actually have this short euphoria feeling, which is caused or brought on by a different set of neurotransmitters. So that means you're not using the usual neurotransmitters to feel elated. You are replacing it with a different neurotransmitter, which are endorphins, which are not normally released unless you do something painful. Uh, I mean, that kind of painful. Lah. Exercise painful, right? Yeah, that kind. The no, pleasure. No, no, no. Uh, go and inflate some pain for yourself, but we are talking about exercise inflated. Yes, that, kind of pain, uh, that kind of pain because it is easily reversed. The pain reverses, but the endorphin effect lasts. You know, and that's why you find yourself going for it again and again. You know, doctor, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, subject. I think this we can talk about and debate about it also. Um, and especially after an exercise program, or even if you are going for a walk or even you are spending a good 45 minutes for yourself, right? Without any disruption on your social media or phone or gadgets. But what I think is that you are treating with love and respect for your body. 
you know it's just like a ongoing 24 hours 24 7 non-stop right but when you turn inwards and spend good time for your exercises so you keep in control of insanity you know you keep you know you're respecting your cardiovascular system i think somehow or other the body tends to be a little happy and that's why if you see some people in the gym are addicted because they need to exercise if they don't exercise they become a angry and a hungry bear right. correct so correct that is a that is a very good diversion it is a, a healthy diversion <laughs> you know it is as good as any medication you can take but the caveat still remains what i told you you must not have something really heavy in the back of your mind yes you need to be able to push that aside then not many can do that we are hamstrung by this one as i said if you are running and in the mind i instead of running now i should be you know preparing the slides somehow i didn't i don't think the slides are correct for my presentation tomorrow and then there's not just a single presentation you've got another one coming in two days time and then someone is calling and uh, calling you and asking you to go over and get a, a big contract sorted out uh, you can't afford to make a mistake in that contract then there is always an overriding factor so that's why you most people who manage to push this aside they do very well but those who cannot find that the, it is more and more of a challenge as time goes on you know doctor we have a lot of comments coming up so i'm going to read a few of the comments um okay. all the stress managing tips from doctor i think uh, she's referring to all the stress managing uh, tips that you earlier talk on uh, mm -hmm. One of the people also said that was very weak and kind of emotional. Went for a 5.5 kilometer run and right. now feeling very good. So I think these are the few of the uh, comments that keeps on coming in and uh, people are actually feeling that exercise does play a part. And, uh, exercise plays a very big part, uh, Vance. You're absolutely right. Very big part. The cheapest and freest kind of uh, stress release you can undertake. All right, doctor. Thank you so much. So now we can move on and finish up our few slides more. Right. Oh, we still have a number, but now man. let's talk yeah. about cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. Again, as what I mentioned, it's psychotherapy. Don't don't look at the word psycho and get all worked up. It is a medical term. Yeah. Right. It's just mind. Psycho means mind. It means therapy of your mind. So there's nothing psychiatric about it. Right. Right. Practitioners limit the distorted thinking, right? They teach you how to numb yourself to negative thoughts, right? They will, if you have a panic disorder, they will reinforce that it is not a heart attack. They will show you the 10 ECGs that have been done and then they keep doing it to you. And then they will also try to gently expose you to smaller and smaller fears. Maybe if you're scared of cockroaches, they let you see a very small one first and then, you know, they, they get a slightly... And after a while, you get numb to this kind of stresses. Right? Now, talking about medications, yeah, there's a whole lot of medications, but let me just supervise you. Sorry, Doctor, I lost your, I lost you here for one, sorry. Medications, yeah, there are various medications and they can include antidepressants, benzodiazepines, beta blockers, tricyclics. There's a lot of medications out there, but it always has to be under proper supervision and not for the long term, right? Don't use it as an escape mechanism, right? It's just to train your mind what is the right way. It's like when you play a game, say you're playing badminton and then the coach teaches you the right way to, to, to smash the shuttlecock. You know, that's all you need to do. So you don't need a coach after that. Once you've learned the right technique, how to smash, it's exactly how you will smash the next 10 times. So what okay. you're going to do is the patient teaches you what you need, what level you need to achieve, and then you train your brain to fix it at that level without the medication. Well said, doctor. So that's for the uh, stress part. But um, doctor, I mean, um, as you talk a little bit on stress, I think that there's also another uh, uh, area that I also want to talk about. Um, people tend to go into a few other other aspects, but I'm going to cover a little bit on uh, sleeping pills. So right. sleeping pills to avoid problems, sleeping pills to avoid uh, anxiety, uh, sleeping pills to avoid other factors like panic disorder and so and so forth. Because when I sleep, I do not know anything and I'm knock off. And the next right. morning, coming in, I will deal with it and then I want to go and sleep. So that's a kind of a fear and that actually become addictive and habitual. And 
and it's it's not too good, right? I mean, for long term, because you are forcing your body to sleep, and then and then you are screw. I mean, to you are upsetting the whole biological clock of your sleeping hours, your waking up Absolutely. hours, and your digestive Absolutely. system, so and so forth. Absolutely. No, you look in this list. There's no sleeping tablets, no sedative medication being spoken about, because what you see the problem is. I, I'll come to that uh, when we are talking about sleep. Uh, maybe we'll go to that. Then we'll. Uh, okay. I'll just make a note on that. Okay, okay. we're talking about now sleeplessness, or the medical term is insomnia, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it is a sleep disorder where you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, right? It can be an acute or a short term, right? If you're going to a new place or you've got some uh, project coming up, it can be short term or it can also last a long time, which is chronic. And it also come and go, right? What we call acute is a one night to a few weeks. But if you have it for at least three nights for three months or more per week, three nights carrying on for more than three months, you become a chronic insomniac, right? Now, that's exactly what I have mentioned. And what are the symptoms that are usually here in this thing? You get fatigued. It's not just unable to sleep because the next day you're going to get fatigued. You have poor concentration. You have impaired performance. You feel malaise and you have behavioral problems. You're irritable or you're unhappy or you, you're very slow in answering or you're just very nonchalant about everything. You suddenly start to feel a some kind of pains here and there your brain it just wants you to go to sleep but you cannot ah the very common thing is headache and sometimes you have a lot of nausea because you have a lot of acid coming out when you don't sleep there's a as long as you're awake your your body your stomach keeps producing acid thinking that it's time to eat something and then you know at the end of the day you get hyper acidity there you okay go. right so now what are the different causes Causes of primary insomnia are stress, right? That one we went through this now. Things that change, yeah? a lot of noise. You live with noisy neighbors. Your family members are blaring the radio and, or playing the guitar or drums or something like that. There's not a lot of light coming into your room. Uh, changes in temperature, too warm, too cold. If you travel a lot, you may have jet lag. That's for primary. Primary meaning it just comes by itself. But other conditions, other illnesses which need to be ruled out are mental health issues like depression and anxiety, certain medications that you take, like especially for colds, coughs, the antihistamines, right? Medications for anxiety and depression also cause a lot of changes in your sleep pattern until you really cannot sleep. You have a lot of pain and discomfort at night for some reason. You know, you have a bad back, you have bad joints, you have rheumatism, you have rheumatoid arthritis. So when it gets cold, the pain starts coming on. You have carpal tunnel syndrome, you feel some numbness. Then that kind of discomfort keeps you awake. You start abusing caffeine, not using, yeah, ca abusing caffeine, tobacco and alcohol. You have endocrine problems that are usually related to your thyroid. And yeah. disorders like sleep apnea. Okay, you can get here, right? Yes, doctor, I can hear you well. So, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, the name is sleep, but you don't sleep because you, the, this actually is a good time to, to sort of talk about the various stages of sleep. Now, what I normally tell my patients is sleep is like a Chinese food. If you go to a Chinese food, of things that come in there. You get an appetizer, you get a soup, you get some fish, then you get the vegetable, then you get rice and things like that. So then when you go through that whole, whole set of courses, you feel like you've had a proper meal. The same goes for sleep. Now roughly for the lay person, I know there are much more details than this, but just put it this way. What happens when you actually talk about sleep is you go through four stages of this. Just, just enough. Stage one is when you feel very dizzy. Sorry, doctor. I mean, uh, the, the 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 I think the speaker is very muffled. It's like yeah. up and down. Yeah, I think when you put the, the the monitor a little bit higher, I think that's very smooth. Okay, now now oh, it's all right. Yeah, perfect, doctor. Thank mm -hmm. you. So now stage one. When you talk about stage one, you're dealing with. Uh, just falling asleep. You know, when you look at someone, just their eyes start to droop. That's stage one. 
they feel sleepy and then you go to stage one. Then when you actually fall asleep that stage two, in stage two, you start to have some kind of dreams. Then you go to stage three, that's the REM sleep. You have vivid dreams. If you're woken up at this time, you know, you, 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 will, you will describe very vivid dreams. But then you go into stage four where you are completely paralyzed because then you won't react to your dreams. But what's actually happening in your brain is your brain is seeing through, just like how you clear your hard drive on your computer, it's seeing through the memories of the day or the past, and then it decides if it's an unimportant memory, it gets knocked off, you know, it gets erased. So, for example, today you park your car, say, in a, in, in a specific place in a, a, a supermarket, then you drove home. By the next day, you will most likely forget exactly where you had parked the car yesterday because your brain has decided that this is not an important piece of information. It erases it then, leaving more space for new memories to come in. Now, what happens when you have new memories coming in is that's the thing. If you are full and you don't go into stage four, your brain is now unable to actually do its clearing system. So your brain then now becomes overloaded with a lot of rubbish thoughts. Thoughts that get jumbled up, they get mixed up because you know they were not supposed to be kept as long-term memories. But your brain didn't erase them. They are all in the temp file. The temp file is now really full. So if this means anything, what it means is when you do, that's the importance of sleep. If you don't get enough of that, the next day when you wake up, you are going to get up in a real frenzied state. The same thing happens when you take a sleeping tablet. You jump into the wrong stage and you stay there. You don't follow the right stage. So that's why you give yourself the psychological satisfaction that you have slept. It's just like going to the Chinese dinner. You just ate the fish. You didn't eat anything else. You say, I've eaten something for the dinner, yet it's not a complete meal. So that's what a sleeping tablet does to you. So only if it's just something that need, you need to tide over a day or two, you take a sleeping tablet. Otherwise, you will find that most doctors don't prescribe sleeping tablets. Because otherwise, then you disrupt the entire pattern as Vance very correctly pointed out you know, in the, in the, when we were discussing the last slide. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. What are the risk factors of getting insomnia? It somehow affects women more than men. Uh, older people are more affected than younger people. Younger and middle-aged African Americans have a higher risk. Right. Also, other risk factors: if you have a long-term illness like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and then you're taking all sorts of medications. If you have other mental health issues, or you work in night shifts or shifts that rotate around. Okay. All right. Again, acute insomnia may not need treatment. It is hard for you to do everyday activities if you're tired. So then you we will help you for a short time, right? They work. They should work very quickly, briefly, and not have a hangover the next day. Don't just go and get some over-the-counter sleeping pills. There are some of them. Some pharmacies still sell the very old ones that work for about thirty-six hours, and you go to work the next day sounding like a zombie, right? All right. Uh, if it's chronic, we need to find out what exactly is the trigger factor. Treat the triggering factor. A lot of times, things get better. Right? Most of the complications of insomnia, I've actually already told you this now. So, you know, it just takes a toll on your body. So, how do you prevent insomnia? This is a busy site, but a lot of times, it's just common sense. You don't really need to try. I'll just go through it. What's important is something called sleep hygiene. What do you do when you sleep? Just like you, know, before you eat, you wash your face, you, you sit in a comfortable seat, you get your water. So, uh, uh, just have to stop you for a while. Uh, uh -huh. the voice became a little muffled again. Sorry. Okay, now I must tell my son. Okay, so you go to sleep at the same time every night, and you get up at the same time every morning. Right? Do not take naps during the day. Do not use phones or e-books because the light there will change your internal clock because your brain then suddenly thinks it's daytime because the light is right on your face. So this uh, the thing about blue light, they say it helps, but you know, a lot of people, even with that, your mind still gets fooled into thinking it's daytime. Avoid caffeine, avoid nicotine, avoid alcohol, right? Caffeine and nicotine are stimulants. Don't 
take the heavy meat. They will be as comfortable as possible. Follow a simple routine. Take a go free. The calming book. Read the calming book. Listen to music. Take a bath. Nice warm bath. And your bed. Do not use it for anything other than sleep and sex. Right? Don't use it as your mini office. Sorry, doctor. We lost you again. We lost you on the. Yeah, it. I was very frustrating. Then, um, yeah. Uh, if you where was I? So now I forgot. Yeah, follow a routine. Do not use your bed for anything else. You know, don't use it as a call center. Don't use it as a um. What do you call that? Uh, uh, of mini office or anything like that, right? And if you can't fall asleep and not drowsy, get up, walk around, do something calming, right? Don't uh, do something that's really exciting. Just go and do something calming, uh, change the room, sit down for a while, listen to a music in a different room, and then read something. And then when you feel sleepy, go back to sleep, right? Because your mind psychologically, if it's associating the bed with sleep and it's not really working, you will tend to have a problem, right? If you tend to lie awake and worry about things, make a to-do list before you go to bed, right? Then once you have sorted out things for the day, what you are planning to do the next day, then you have already been able to switch off the thing. Okay, I believe this will be the. Okay, let me just. Done, dear doctor. Yes, I think we are done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see me now? Yes, doctor. How about you? We're going to uh, minimize your your slide presentation, and then we can come in the front. Yes. Okay, doctor. So that was a good um, more than an hour of a presentation. Thank you so much. We have a couple of uh, questions that came in. Uh, I'm right. going to read out one from Carol. I think the Facebook Carol, must go off. I think. Yeah, it's Facebook, right? Uh, Carol. Carol uh, has asked. Let me get the Facebook I out. Have, uh, sleep anxiety. And right. I do have a very constant eight hours of sleep sometimes is six hours five hours and sometimes i wake up with panic attacks thinking that unknown fears me lots of it what is your advice doctor well again you, you a lot of times when you have this kind of problem you need to address what exactly are the triggers that you think are are that is it work related issues that are triggers a lot of times it's a transference of the problem itself it's not a direct a to b relationship but you know you might suddenly find that each time you have a conversation with say someone annoying in the workplace you come home and then you start having all these problems when you go to sleep right so you need to actually have a very critical analysis of what really is the trigger Right. So what was the question again? She wanted to know whether that's, yeah. So that's the thing. How you overcome that has to be sort of personalized to you. A lot of your personal day-to-day -day, um, things need to be actually ironed out, put on a table and actually deeply analyzed. Sometimes you will be surprised to find it's the smallest of things that actually trigger a reaction. What is normal? Maybe it's just an annoying sound from a neighbor may actually trigger some of this. So if you look at a common denominator as to what really is causing this problem, you will find that over time you will be able to do some kind of avoidance or sort of then once you've already understood what it is, you will find that it is easy to, 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 to handle. Thank you, doctor, for the uh, answering that uh, particular question. Thank you, Carol, as well. Uh, doctor, I mean, we, we do know that, um, I mean, we, I, I know we had this discussion and you say that uh, you know the brain and the mind, the subconscious and the conscious mind. We, we talked, we talked a lot on the first meeting. Uh, but um, do you think that we can actually, um, at certain point of our time, I mean, in, in any given time, um, when we are sitting calm or when we are in, in nature walk or whatever we are doing, that's something that makes us happy. Um, subconscious mind and conscious mind. I mean, you know, they 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 say this to differentiate it. Probably you will say it in a different way, but. Um, there are certain times I think we can block off my subconscious and pop up all the bubbles. Not because when we are driving, we can't be thinking, I need to fetch the water, I need to feed the cat, I need to put up the chain for the reaction of oil. I can't be doing this. I only focus on my conscious mind. 
So can we say that I am deactivating the art subconscious mind and focusing the subconscious mind itself? Actually, no. The subconscious part is automatic. It runs on autopilot. You cannot, you cannot uh, deactivate the subconscious mind because that is actually uh, sort of hotwired to work by default. Right. So trying to say that I'm going to take that off and then uh, just leave it on the conscious mind. It doesn't it doesn't work that way because the subconscious mind is more than processing everything. The sounds that you hear, the reaction to the sounds, all that work in that way. So it's not so easy to really because the subconscious mind is so you're, if you're trying to switch it off, you just need to set up your mind. And then the tells you, even when you're driving, the subconscious mind is the one that presses the brake for you. When the okay. Brake, like, you have to think, oh, press my brake. No, the subconscious Sorry, doctor. I think we are losing a little of your voice. I think it's because of the speaker. I think. I think. Uh, I but other than that, I, think. I don't know. <laughs> it uh, is up and down. Yeah. So you know, the subconscious mind is the one that actually makes your mind. Uh, you know, it it controls everything. You know, the 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 thing that you. For example, you know, as I said, breaking your car when you see the red light in front is your subconscious mind. It's not your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is thinking, what shall I buy my wife for dinner today? That is a conscious thought. Uh, uh, tomorrow I need to go to work and tell the guy that, you know, this is this. That is a conscious thought. But the subconscious mind is the one that triggers off automatic reactions. Even when you go to the supermarket, you, you, you gravitate automatically to the cashier because it's your subconscious mind thinking. You, you, you've just decided, I bought everything I want. The next thing you know, you're, you're at the cashier's counter, you know, with your credit card or your cash, waiting to pay, right? Now, if you don't want to pay, you need to override that thought because most people yeah. will go to the cashier, you know? Yeah. Now, the conscious thought says, hey, maybe I can get away without paying. That's a conscious thought. But your subconscious says, okay, boy, finish paying, finish buying, let's go to the shop and let's go to the counter and pay and go home. That is the thought. All right, we have a question from uh, Audrey Chan. She said, is sleep, is light sleep considered as an insomnia? Okay, it's very easy. It's just like a meal. Some people are happy with a bowl of, uh, you know, a small bowl of rice and some people need to eat an entire banana leaf uh, every day. It's not that. It's how you get up from the activity. If you get up in the morning feeling fresh, really gung-ho, you go through the day as normal, that's good enough. You know, if you how you wake up. If you wake up in the morning and think you have or feel you have not slept enough, most likely you have insomnia. You know, some people can sleep in just four hours. You know, we as doctors also we get up and go back to sleep. Get up and go to sleep. It depends on how you wake up the next morning. If you wake up the next morning, you know, and with a you know a small cup of coffee, you're fine. You know, with your breakfast, you're okay, and you're you know all ready to go to work. You have slept well. Thank you, doctor. And also another question also related to sleep. I think I think a lot of us are in an in a era that uh, constantly we are uh, with, with deadlines and projects and eight to five job and some are like sheep works, constantly putting a lot of pressure. So I think this question is quite relevant. I have an interrupt sleep, uh, Tavani has asked, as I wait to pee in the middle of the night. How may I address this sleeping pattern? No, the question is, are you able to go back to sleep as usual, right? Getting up to pee in the middle of the night is a physiological reaction. Most of us do it. You know, as we grow older, we will have to go to the washroom. Now, if you really think that is already a concern, the trigger for getting up to go and pee is actually drinking water. So what you need to do is drink as much water as you can, say, before 4 p.m. and then very minimal fluids after that. That will then reduce the trigger. Sometimes you need to find out why you're waking up to pee in the night. All right. Sometimes a urinary tract infection or if you have an irritable uh, bladder, we can work on that. 
but the general physiological reaction everybody has of getting up to go to the to pee is quite straightforward now the next question is this what are your practices when you pee you know is the bathroom on suite or do you need to walk and open two or three doors before you get to your bathroom some people have a common bathroom some people have a on suite bathroom number one number two some people need to you know have a good wash after they have to pee right they need that action of going switching on the water waiting for it to warm up or cool down or the temperature is different that activities are done again that's going to interrupt your sleep that's going to interrupt with your sleep hygiene you know and then you sometimes need to switch on the light and then uh, because you can't find your way that is another problem so you want to number one try not to go to the washroom if you can number two if you cannot then you must make it as hygienic as possible in the sense that you know you put a little night light in a little corner that will guide you so you can just quickly go to the washroom use a tissue jump back into bed right you need to adjust it for yourself thank you doctor i mean uh, to all the viewers there thank you so much for tuning in till almost one hour 30 minutes the doctor thank you so much for the time but of course we have another two more questions doctor i mean if we can yeah, take that not a problem so to the viewers i mean if you do have anything that you want to ask doc at this point of time please send in the questions and i'll post this to doc as well to actually to talk it about in the meantime i got gopal uh gopal has actually asked you doctor um my son is 13 years old and he has an habit of looking at his phone even though i confiscate confiscate the phone but he tends to be on the phone most of the time without my knowledge how do i control this is it an addiction yeah, if i can if i can answer that i think uh, i will be i will you be, be one a, of the... teacher right now. a teacher right now. so i think yeah, probably yeah, yeah. i think what the what what mr gopal wants to know is i think he's trying to find out whether is it a, some kind of an addiction that that actually causes because a lot of people on the phone and before sleeping is that i think that's related to sleep and addiction as well no the question of addiction is this an addiction is something that is done above what everybody else does now looking at the phone getting yourself occupied with that is exactly what we used to do those days we were watching television you know for the most of the evening now people have moved migrated to doing it with their phones and because the phone is more interactive they tend to use it a lot so calling it an addiction is probably not right because by definition an addiction causes changes in physical changes in your body when it's deprived now if you are a ganja smoker or a heroin smoker or you've been injecting heroin and suddenly i cut off your ganja supply or eh, you go into all this kind of shaking shivering sweating now that becomes an addiction so if your son now you know you take away his phone and he's shaking and shivering away that is an addiction you know or if he's finding you know all sorts of ways to get it and he can't focus on anything else other than trying to get back that phone that is an addiction otherwise it has become a nasty habit you know it's not harmful but because once you all know what a nasty habit does to you it takes away your functioning of all the other aspects of your life so you call it a nasty habit you don't call it an addiction because i'm sure your son is not you know going into spasms when you take away his phone but he becomes an unfriendly character he probably gets very distracted and he's not happy with what is there and he keeps complaining to everybody that becomes a nasty habit you know doctor we also have uh, a few of uh, viewers selina fernando if i got her name correct or his name he said doc thank you doctor it's a good explanation so i do see that a lot of people are sending a lot of regards to you doctor because of the way you oh, much appreciated thank you thank you for the past one hour one and a half hours i mean we we still have a bit maybe another five more minutes for any more questions no so problem can, uh please ask us and uh, we try to uh answer it as possible but in the meantime i'll love to have um, a chat with you doctor so uh, i mean did he, can, I, i'm not sure because i i the moment when i had a discussion with you uh we talked a lot about a little bit of the human mind and kind of stuff i say it's a more like a complex machine 
But you say, no, it's not a complex mission. Then what do you call a mind is? Because it's making judging for us. We are worried about people are commenting us, gossip, uh, self, uh, um, what do you call it? self claims. Uh, self, uh, people are not appreciating us. So there's so many things are judging and moving and reactions, hormones, hard liver. So what is our mission? It's not a complex then. No, okay. When I say not complex, it's just like, again, like your car. You know, uh, the average person sees a car as something that you get in. You need to know how to open the door. You need to turn the key. You move it into gear. Wheel start rolling. You start driving and you can steer the car. It's all you need to know about the car. It's really for the average driver, knowing how the car steers, which wheel turns, the steering rack moving one differential versus another, it's really not helping him become a better driver. So the same thing is with the mind. If you think too much, you know, if you are now now obsessed, imagine in the car, you are now obsessed how the steering is working. You know, the steering rack and which differential, and then uh, uh, you know the which cylinder, which camshaft, which top dead center. <laughs> this kind of thing. If you worry about it, it won't make you a better driver. But you need to appreciate the fact that a car can just turn the key, push a lever that's called the gear stick and press a little pedal and the car starts moving the car's engineers worry about everything else you know what i mean this is how you simplify things because if not when what you're going to do is you're sitting down there and you're worrying about every single squeak you hear from the car every single blink of a light you worries you because you then try to extend your your sort of mindset into something which God gave you as a simple structure. It keeps you awake. It lets you think. It helps you remember. It takes what's important. It tells you what is right, what is wrong. That's all you need to know about your mind. You need to know it's a whole lot of engineering behind it, yes. But you don't need to know what that engineering is. Because then you start worrying, when will I get dementia? When will I get Parkinson's? When will I get the next brain tumor? When will I get uh, uh, ADEM, for example? If you know now something called ADEM can paralyze you, you will start thinking, oh, is my mind going to go into ADEM at any point soon? So that's what I'm saying. Because each time you get into a car and you think that the car is going to explode, yes, there are some where the cars have exploded or the planes are going to fly off. Yes, there are. But if you want to sit and worry about that, you're not going to be able to find the time. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, of course, uh, there are a few more questions coming up, but I'm going to ask you one more thing, Doctor. Um, you know, when situation happens around us, right? Um, right. Oh, uh, marriage example, uh, 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 bad news, uh, like we right. talked about, right? When we're in a, in a, in a certain uh, situation, right? Uh, a funeral, you won't be laughing. If you're laughing, then something has happened to you. So, I mean, there's so many things that we, we want to be conscious because people are judging. I mean, that's a part because that's where we are judging and making the hormones are firing just like the car cams and the camshafts and in, in a car engine. But but one thing that I would really want to ask you, Doctor, is as we, as we try to be as simple as possible, as we try to be more happier and try not to think too much, and, and do you think because of this environmental stress, work stress and and because of certain event has happened the hormones go a wire and we do not know how to control it or rather we don't know how to react it and we try to suppress it and over the years it just explodes and when came into a depression anxiety panic is that is that the reason is that the reason why we are keeping it before we finding a solution so if i know that i'm sad i'm getting grumpy oh i need to do a quick fix I need to go and see somebody. I, I, I need to go and see a psychologist or, or because they will judge me. Is that the reason why a lot of people are facing this situation at this point of time? So there's only one. It is a possibility. It's like that. It's an add-on effect. It's an add-on effect. You know, you add something, you keep it in your mind, then there's one part of your mind that can adjust to that thought. Then you keep 
thought, you know, adding on and adding on and adding on without re being able to remove the old one. What you have done is just buried it. Now, what you're doing is you are just, for example, now if you're a criminal and you're burying bodies behind your backyard, at one point in time, there'll be no more place to bury the bodies and then the cops are going to catch you because they're going to see one exposed. The same thing. It's an add-on effect. Because the first time you do something and you don't get worried about it, you think that I can hope. So you take on a something bit bigger. Then there's an add-on effect to that. So as time goes on, you will reach the tipping point. And sometimes the one that tips it is a very minor issue, but it's just like the last drop in a cup that overflows in the zinc. You know, one last drop has to overflow. So that might be a trivial issue. That's the problem. Most people have problem reconciling. They cannot understand how such a trivial issue triggered such a big reaction. But they forgot that it's a cup has already been all right to the brim all this while. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. So we will just take one more session of uh, question and then we will end this session, Doctor, because I know you haven't taken your dinner. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we have to take care of ourselves, you know, then only we can we can provide whatever uh, professional help to people, you know, because people need us. Uh, we need people. Supplies. So it's uh, both, both, uh, both of them need us, you know, we need them and they need us. So I'm going to uh, uh, get this demonstrate balance. Um, can sleep deprivation increase the risk of brain tumor? I lost my grandmom to a brain tumor. She used to be sleeping or sleep deprived due to granddad's loud snoring? Okay. Short answer, no. Short answer, no. You know, because we have single people who sleep well still come with a brain tumor. We have people who sleep, you know, without a snoring partner and yet develop a brain tumor. So there is no scientific evidence to link this to that. No. It's just pure coincidence that uh, the brain tumor came on. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for the past one hour and 14 minutes. But before we come to an end, doctor, is there any, uh, I mean, today we learned that the conscious mind is not actively making decision. It's the subconscious mind that's making the decision. Uh, but apart from that, uh, any final um, suggestion or advices that you want to give to our advisors, to the weavers? Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, just understand what stress is. It is just what it is. If you understand stress and you know how it works, you will not worry too much about it. right? You will understand that it's actually a helping mechanism. Most people hear the word stress and they go into a very negative connotation about it. No, it is something that helps you. You just need to know how to manage it. Again, like the car I showed you. You know that if you press the accelerator too much, it's going to knock into something. But you know that if you are able to control the accelerator and the brake, you're not going to knock into anything. Now, once you have learned that, you are not scared of the car anymore. The first day when you went to driving school, when you started, felt the car move on its own, you got a bit scared. But the moment the instructor told you, no, you press the brake, see what happens, and you press the brake, and oh, I can stop the car now. Oh, okay, I'm done. I'm good. You see, that's exactly what you know. The car is helping you. The accelerator pedal helps you to move the car. But you also need to know when to press the brake. And then you shouldn't be worrying that I'm going to knock into something by pressing this accelerator because you know there is a brake. Right? So this is how you teach your mind. You, you need to teach your own mind because only you know your own mind. Right? When you know your own mind, you know what you need to actually you know, help it function better, you know? You know doctor, your, your explanation behind the car theory is fantastic because it makes people understand. Right. Yes, I think most of our viewers have a driving license, they have driven a car, they ride a motorbike. You do, you do understand, but it's so easy. If you correlate this with that, you know, you will take away a lot of worry. If you drive a car waiting for some error message to come out on the dashboard or say the car is catching fire, then you will never drive a car. You know, you're just going to sit at home and waste your entire life. Not Use your car rightly, nothing will happen. Even if it does, it just boils down to bad luck and there's a way of handling it. Take your mind as your car. You know, it goes where you want it to go. 
you don't have to worry about the fuel injector or the camshaft or anything. You don't have to worry about that. The mind will take care. The car's computer will take care of most of that. That's the subconscious mind you have. You just need to do the inputs, the steering, the brake, the accelerator. Do it properly. It's like what you do to your brain. Do it properly. It will work well. Yes, there will be problems. People drive uh, lemons at times, junks at times, but they are still getting along. Think about it that way. You know, they are not, uh, you know, not every lemon is stopping by the roadside. You know, Just Singapore, I know, you know they, Singapore don't have lemons because they take away the cars from the road. But in Malaysia, <laughs> you will find all sorts of cars. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, I'm giving yeah. a Malaysian example, but if you have any relatives in Malaysia, you will find that their cars stop by the roadside. But in general, most junk still run. I agree, Doctor. That was a, a fantastic way of uh, explaining things by lemons and cars. And But, Doctor, on a lighter side, before you know we, we call this an uh, end of a session, I mean, it's my question to you. Uh, on a lighter side, but of course, uh, you know, we have the heart, the kidney, the liver, the lungs, uh, the pancreas, um, and, and so and so forth. There are many other soft muscles, you know, primary muscle, major muscles, you know, so many things, bones, skeletal. You know, and the brains, but who is controlling us? You know, who is controlling us? I mean, I know this might a bit, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you because I mean, you have the profession and in the expertise of the mind, the brain, the cells. You know, you talk about the wiring. You could, you know, if we are very well disciplined and professional and act towards certain situations and we don't want to show our weakness, only, you know, there's so many things. Then who is really controlling us, doctor? I mean, in, in terms exactly. of... Exactly. You see, you control yourself. The person who put the key into the ignition is the one controlling the car. That's... Yes. <laughs> exactly. The, the car is knows that there is a driver. The car is not sitting. The car says, okay, the driver has come in. The key is turned on. Let me do my part. I'm not going to worry about anything else. And you control your own mind. The problem is you cannot control how the camshaft turns and how the fuel injector works. You cannot do that. But you have what you have to do. You have the accelerator pedal, the brake, the gear stick, and the steering wheel in your hand. How you use it, how you utilize it, it's your thing. Again, if your car is a sort of a family car, you are not going to race with a Porsche 911 and the traffic light. If you think that you can do that, then you have overstretched your car. Just because the guy next to you has a 911 and he is gunning it off the traffic light in uh, you know 4.8 seconds in to reach 100 kilometers an hour, it really does not behoove you to do the same thing. Because as you know, your mind is not designed for that. And you know that at some point in time, if that Porsche guy is either going to burn out his engine or he's going to get caught by the cops or something is going to happen to him. You know, you know that. So you're not going to do what your car is capable of. It is only capable of nine seconds of a zero to hundred. It goes at a Yes, you can use your point of destination without having to show. Hey, you know, doctor. Today I learned something about you. You're not only a doctor; you're also an engineer. True, <laughs> Vince. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you that you know, if you talk in medical terms, it's just so okay. relatable to what you do day to day. You know, it's a day to day affair. Your body works like a machine. And your machine works only as well as you utilize it and you treat it. And you understand the basics of it. That's all you need to do. You know, Doctor, I, I, it is my great honor and blessings as well to have... Uh, 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 obviously, of course, not co coffee you know, in, in, in person, but I'm sure once the borders are open up, I'm going to fly yes. in. I, I'm going to... Oh, yeah, know, I look forward to that. Yes, and then uh, if you have the vice versa to be back in Singapore also. But uh, I think um, uh, to have uh, a discussion with a neurologist for more than one hour and 45 minutes, sharing humbly and in a, in a manner that I think is so easy to understand, you know, you know, it didn't went into our, well, of course, you can go into very scientific and medically and you know, talk things that, you know, people don't understand. But, you know, you use the car. Uh, everything is about the car. It's, you know, you use that as an example to relate 
to 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 things. I think that was a very um, uh, uh, easy way to make people understand. And I think uh, even at this point of time, I think she said doctors' explanations are so retailable and love it. You know, so you have a lot of fans right now, doctor. Come on, well done. <laughs> You got a fan base right now. I mean, uh, I, I can feel it because it's a very great discussion because um, uh, because I can feel it as well because the way you you, you went through it because we only agree for one hour, but uh, I mean we have had to one hour. No worries. Uh, yeah, it's always a pro uh, always a pleasure there, Vince. No problem. Thank you so much, Doctor. I mean, we will stay connected and uh, we're gonna get in touch very soon. I mean, once the vaccine. Has been found and things get settled. Yeah, uh, coming up, it's it's really so. coming up very soon. We, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel already. So, yeah. sure. And then once once you're in Singapore, I'm going to uh, bring you for a very nice dinner in Singapore. It's oh yes, called, I look forward to it's that. Called, yeah. uh, it's called my favorite place, so it's going to be your favorite place too. It's called Mutus Curry. A lot of people in Singapore love that. Um, I, I it's very healthy. I, I mean, I prefer that. So you should try, and we are going. All right. We will. It's a date. Thank, right, thank you so much. Good night, good night everybody. Good yes. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. I'll sign off now. Yeah, okay. Bye bye. bye bye. All right. Thank you so much, viewers. Uh, even though it's a uh, one hour forty six minutes, I know you are still on live right now. Thank you so much again. Um, like I said, we we try to bring in different different topics at Copy with Vance to bring interesting. Um, different, not only in just uh, fitness, and not only in medical, but we talk about cars, we talk about bikes, we talk about gadgets, and that's what it's all about, copy with Vance, and um, unfortunately, my two cups of coffee has finished for the day. But if you do have any topics in your mind, and if you do want it to be covered, please uh, don't hesitate to message me or put it in the comments, and uh, we will try to address to it. All right? I think we have uh, very... Uh, Long period of time today, all right, one hour, 45 minutes. So let's not take any more time. Please eat well, sleep well, hydrate yourself. Uh, don't get too much of stress, like what doctor said. Just be simple, I know. Things can go rough a bit sometimes. Things can go a bit challenged, but without challenges and obstacles, there's no growth. But too much of stress can actually give you uh, different kind of results, which is, of course, affect your health, your cardiovascular, your blood pressures goes up and we all know that all right uh, i think one of the most expensive and priceless i should not say expensive it's a priceless uh, thing that we need to treasure is our body because that's the only thing that we live in so we got to take care of that all right smile often don't get uh, unnecessary tension you know things are um could get evolved all right we're not going to be in this planet earth for forever all right the planet is about almost about five point over billion years so be happy all right, till our time comes by. Till then, take care. And I'm going to catch you again in my next show with Copy with Vance. Signing off, Vance. See ya.